collisions, cancellations, and closures. A messy winter storm hits the GTA, and it's not over yet. This is going to be a multiple round, multiple pass event. We have problems really all across the GTA. How the city is handling our biggest storm so far this winter and what we can expect in the days ahead. Plus, let's figure out exactly how many of these assaults could have been avoided. Calls for a national task force to address violence on the TTC after two more incidents just today that saw a teen get stabbed on a bus and two transit workers chased by a person with a syringe. And so we're here to announce our first uh, presumptive positive case of novel coronavirus. That was exactly three years ago, Ontario and Canada's first case of COVID-19. A look back at how much has changed and where things could be headed. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. A major winter storm making for a messy and lengthy commute for many in the GTA today. The heavy snow impacting everything from the drive to public transit and flights out of Pearson. As city crews have been working around the clock to clear the roads, but even snow plows having a little bit of difficulty tonight. Dale McDuck joins us live from Warden and Steeles where a plow has knocked down a traffic pole and Dale, thankfully, no one was hurt. That's right, Kilda, but still a very active scene here at Warden and Steeles. The police are still holding this intersection, but as you mentioned, most importantly, nobody was hurt. We'll show you that traffic pole that's been knocked down over there. You can see that there are some city workers trying to figure out how to clean this up. There's also, a, you mentioned, a multi-day. It's going to be a big cleanup job. There's uh, tracks here from a sidewalk plow that just came through moments ago, but, you know, this snow has been coming down for over 12 hours in most parts of the G. GTA. We know that in downtown it's raining, but here on the northern edge, the snow is still very steady. Now, the worst of it happened in late afternoon, early evening, especially during rush hour. We know that the OPP was dealing with 40 active collisions around that time, and it's been very tough to keep up with the amount of snow that's been coming down. Residents having trouble clearing their driveways, municipalities as well, trying to take care of its streets, but the snow is expected to go until tomorrow morning, so it's going to be a multi-day snow event, Kelda, and a multi-day cleanup. Spirits were high to start the day. I feel great. It's it's uh, great weather for skating, so I'm having a good time. I've been waiting to go sledding all year. I was, I was not in uh, Ontario for the first snowstorm, so I'm excited. <laughs> Come afternoon time, the sleds came out, but so did the ice scrapers. The snowy conditions making for a slow drive on city streets, reducing visibility and grinding some highways around the GTA to a halt. It's pretty slippery, pretty bad. And I only live about like five minutes away from here. It took me like 10 minutes. The plows and salters are working hard to keep those highways clear, but uh, with collisions and delays, that delays uh, the road clearing operations. Toronto has deployed its full fleet of equipment, over 1,100 plows and salters for roads, bicycle lanes, and sidewalks. This is going to be a multiple round, multiple pass event. The equipment, the salters, the plows, the sidewalk machines for the bicycle lanes, all of them will have to complete numerous rounds throughout the next few days. Transit also affected. The TTC cancelling all express bus service, GO service running on an alternate schedule. Schedules are now live and they've been live since last night. So we're asking customers to plan ahead, give yourself lots and lots of time, check schedules on the GO alerts, gotransit.com and our social media feeds. It's a similar scene at Pearson Airport with snow clearing equipment running almost nonstop on runways. Numerous flights were cancelled. Pearson advising travelers to check their flight status before heading to the airport. Well, like all weather systems, you really don't know until you're into it. But really what we do consistently is, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best. It's basically capturing the whole eastern seaboard. So arrivals out of New York will be delayed, arrivals uh, out, of, uh, out of other eastern seaboard cities, Boston, as well as Ottawa and Montreal. To make matters even worse, the city is already looking ahead to more problems this weekend. Then on Sunday, we're anticipating another 5 to 10 centimeters. So we'll be out there salting and plowing again Sunday, Monday, and into next week. 
Now, Kelda, I'll just finish off with some notes regarding schools. The Toronto Catholic and Public Board say that they'll make their decisions on whether or not buses will operate tomorrow. They'll make that call at around 6 a.m. But just north of Steeles here, York Region District School Board has already made its decision. Buses, transportation services are a no-go. Kelda? Thanks so much, Dale, for all your work tonight. Now, uh, go get warm. <laughs> All right, meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, you've been tracking this storm all day. Uh, it was pretty intense out there this afternoon. I know things have calmed down a little bit in some areas now. Yeah, we're seeing this system continuing to work its way through, Kelda. And as it does, you're getting some relief back into southwestern Ontario. In fact, it was back towards 6.30 this evening uh, when those snowfall warnings were dropped back towards Windsor and Essex and Chatham-Kent through that region. But they've since been uh, dropped for London up towards Goderich and we're also finding this all the way over towards the Niagara region where we still have the snowfall warning so you can see the areas in white stretching into eastern Ontario this is going to be with you for a while there well into tomorrow morning for the GTA we're going to find it winding down overnight tonight but it's not just the snowfall of course we're seeing the mixing in here as well and you can understand when the temperature is just above freezing for Toronto you're right at the freezing mark in Hamilton we're seeing some of these readings here above into southwestern Ontario so the temperatures have come up a little bit, allowing for that rainfall to mix in, especially very close to the lakeshore. It's been going on for quite some time in the downtown core, but that will continue close to the lakeshore of that mixing, but those temperatures will keep coming down as we go through the overnight. So uh, you can see some of this through here as those temperatures bump up, but it's going to be a ride, and by tomorrow morning, things will be quite a bit chillier, and we'll see some freezing up. I'm going to get into those details of what it's going to feel like and what we're going to be left with tomorrow morning a bit later in the show, but let me just take you through the timeline here. As this works its way through, by 6 a.m., most of the GTA should be okay for that morning commute, Eastern sections and into eastern Ontario, that will be a slightly different story and it will be with you a little bit longer. I'll have all of that coming up, Kelda. All right, talk to you in a bit. Thanks so much, Colette. You got it. There was more violence on the TTC today. A teenage boy was stabbed on a bus near Old Mill Station this afternoon. And this morning, two transit constables were chased by a person with a syringe. Uh, since Saturday, there has been a violent incident on the TTC almost every day. And the calls are growing for something to be done. As Ali Shiasan reports, the head of the Transit Workers Union today calling for a national task force to address the problem. It's another violent day for TTC employees and passengers. At 4 p.m. this afternoon, a 16-year-old boy was stabbed on a bus near Old Mill Station. He's in stable condition and police are looking for the suspect. This morning started with another troubling incident when two special constables were chased with a syringe at Dundas Station. That person was arrested. Nowadays, I'm a little afraid to take the, the bus and the subway. But, you know, sometimes I have no option. Just yesterday, a 23-year-old woman was stabbed in the face and suffered life-altering injuries on the Spadina streetcar. Toronto police arrested and charged a 43-year-old woman with attempted murder. The day before that, a TTC bus was swarmed on Kennedy Road and two constables were beaten. The mounting violence has made for cautious commuting. You always check your surroundings. You try and make sure you know where you are and who's around you. And I, I, I mean, I have kids who take public transit and yeah, it concerns me. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about transit safety. We will, of course, continue to work uh, with the province and with the city on uh, making sure that Canadians are safe. Uh, if there's a role uh, for the federal government to step up, we will no doubt step up. We're here to meet Transit Union President John Danino, who is fed up with the violence and fed up with all the talk. He wants solutions now. I'm prepared to meet with all levels of government, ASAP, and start these discussions on how we can start to mitigate some of these problems. Danino says a spike in transit violence isn't just happening here. Just in Edmonton last week, there was two incidences where um, transit operators were uh, held up at gunpoint. Assaults, being spat on, being punched, being pushed, being threatened and intimidated are all commonplace events in our transit system right across this country. Thousands and thousands of these are happening annually. And again, those are only the ones being reported. Danino says there are ways that cities can address public safety in the immediate term. 
increased visibility and vigilance on our transit system from uh, police officers, enforcement officers, uh, and being out on the front lines, making sure that people see them there, may detour some of those assailants. But big picture. Let's talk about de-escalation. Let's talk about mental health and training on how we identify our, our customers that have mental health issues and whether they're a risk. Uh, and so we need to have those discussions and let's figure out exactly how many of these assaults could have been avoided. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Mayor John Tory is speaking out against the surge of violence in Toronto. And he wants to get officials together from the city, province and federal governments for a summit to address why so many people are falling through the cracks when it comes to mental health supports. Chris Glover has more. We're going to provide you with every bit of support. As Toronto's mayor was celebrating frontline health heroes at a paramedic's graduation ceremony today, he posed a provocative health care question. Are people who have mental health issues treated the same and get the same support as people who have a heart issue or a kidney issue? I think the answer is absolutely not. Seized by several random violent attacks in Toronto, Mayor John Tory says certainly more police and transit constables will be out patrolling, but he wants to push beyond local meetings and solutions, now calling for a national mental health summit with all levels of government. For once and for all, say, all right, what are we going to do about this that's way better than what we're doing today? We have had ongoing and regular conversations. Provincial Health Minister Sylvia Jones says she's on board, especially as provinces are in the middle of negotiations with the feds over health spending. She says the province could use more cash to support mobile crisis intervention teams, matching health workers with police officers. The success rate of those coast teams, mobile crisis intervention teams, have certainly made our community safer. Uh, there is no doubt that more work needs to be done. There is uh, an, an urgency of now to really be doing something, uh, but you have to be doing the right thing. Dr. Quam McKenzie with the Center for Addiction and Mental Health says a summit is brilliant to build a plan, but he says it better include addressing poverty and housing. You really need to be thinking about decreasing the need for services. And that means by, uh, thinking about how you decrease how stressful people's lives are. Because a stressed out population increases the likelihood that people will be in distress and lash out. The urgency of the situation, not just in Toronto, but across the country, is very real. Tory says Toronto can be a leader addressing mental health, but it can't wait. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Today marks exactly three years since Ontario confirmed its first case of COVID-19. It was also the first case anywhere in Canada. Back then, the term COVID didn't even exist. Lorena Redekob has a look at how much has changed. From that first news conference, seven health experts all crammed in at one table. So we're here to announce our first uh, presumptive positive case of novel coronavirus. Three years later, there have been more than 1.5 million confirmed cases. More than 15,000 people have died linked to the virus. Schools were ordered shut down, the first in a yo-yo of open and closed for schools. Toilet paper became a prized possession amid worries of a full shutdown. This morning, I've declared a state of emergency in the province of Ontario. Non-essential businesses then ordered closed. We must flatten the curve and help stop the spread of COVID-19. Many international flights halted. The biggest tragedies in long-term care, with thousands of deaths. At some homes, understaffed and overwhelmed, the military had to be called in to help, documenting horrific conditions. The worst outcomes were in for-profit homes, and, and that's not changing. We're seeing more for-profit homes, even ones that were part of the military reports, uh, getting granted, you know, with, with 25, 30 year licenses to just keep going. She says while many precautions are gone in these homes, the virus isn't. We lost, you know, over 30 residents in this past week alone in long-term care to COVID. That's out of 62 total deaths in the province this week linked to COVID, with more than 6,000 confirmed cases. Though unlike earlier in the pandemic, testing is rare. Another change, vaccines, the first to give into a personal support worker in long-term care. We had a huge effort with public health, family physicians, hospital staff to go into these facilities and vaccinate these patients, which felt really fantastic. 
uh, right at the beginning because we knew how vulnerable that population was. He sees some positives to the pandemic, different parts of the healthcare system working together, but would like to see more changes. We have a wonderful vaccine registry for the COVID-19 vaccine. It would be wonderful if we could expand that to all vaccines so patients don't have to walk around with that yellow card, try to figure out if they've had this vaccine or the other vaccine. With this virus expected to stick around, he'd also like to see more work on improving ventilation in public spaces. Lorenda Rudakop, CBC. Welcome back. Uh, parents out there will know this. After having kids, it doesn't take too long before your home is full of toys. Now, with that in mind, two GTA moms decided to start a toy rental business. As Tally Ricci reports, their goal, not only to reduce clutter, but to help parents be more sustainable. Can you show everybody how you play with this one? As is the case with most toddlers, this excitement is often short-lived. It's something this mom wanted to plan ahead for. You get toys, your baby is interested in them for a while, and then, you know, inevitably they lose interest. And in a traditional model where you're buying, you're stuck with that clutter. Let's say that he loved this. Before her son was even born, she did some research online and came across the Toy Exchange Club. Basically, the idea is renting the toys instead of buying them. I was overwhelmed with the idea of how to play with my child and I also did not want to have my living room overrun with plastic and toy clutter. So For the founders, the idea was born out of their experience being moms, not wanting clutter around the house but also wanting to keep toys out of the landfill. So families receive a box of seven to eight toys for three months. They also receive with that box a, a guide on how to play with each toy and what development milestones your child should be reaching within that time period. At the end of the three months, families return the box in exchange for a new box of toys that are more challenging. The toys are Montessori inspired. Uh, they're all wooden. Um, they are curated specifically to support a child's age and developmental stage. I hope that we can sort of reframe the way that families think about toys and uh, the fact that toys are not we don't need to own them, especially in those early years. They're outgrown so quickly. As more people try to shop sustainably, the Toronto Environmental Alliance says businesses that focus on a sharing economy are becoming more popular. It's a trend that's happening in the clothing industry too. When it comes to things like toys or even clothing, being able to share or borrow or rent them instead of owning it yourself is a really great way that we can reduce waste, save money and reduce the environmental impact. Hey, should we put these ones in? Sonia hopes the idea inspires other parents to keep the planet in mind. My hope is really that more families and more parents understand that the, there are options and uh, you don't have to sacrifice what you want for your children um, just because you want to do it sustainably. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. And you are looking at a live shot of the downtown skyline. It's cloudy with a rain-snow mix tonight. Currently, it's around 2 degrees in the city. All right, let's go back to Colette now with a look at what we can expect in the coming days. And Colette, you did mention that the morning commute should be okay, not too, too bad. Yeah, it's not looking too bad. There are going to be a couple of areas I'm a little concerned about, and I'm going to explain where and why that is. Because for now, and this is kind of a clue here, is we're looking at wet snow, but close to the lakeshore, it's more of wet snow mixing with rain or turning over to rain, but we're going to see colder air filtering in. So we get into some slick spots when you have that refreezing. It will be tapering off for the GTA. It's already happened in southwestern Ontario quite a bit earlier towards the Windsor area. Area. And uh, we're just seeing that happening for the GTA overnight tonight towards the morning hours. Probably, I'm thinking before, well before that morning commute, unless you're out there at 5 a.m. If you're out there between 6 and 8 or 9, you should be all right. Eastern sections will be a little bit different. It's going to take a bit more time there and certainly for eastern Ontario. But the cold temperatures, once they 
move down again or drop again and things freeze up, that's going to stick around for a while. So we're going to hold on to quite a bit of this snowfall and we'll look at how much we're talking about here in just a moment. You can see what's going on on the radar with that mixing where we get into the pinks or you see the green, obviously rain out over the lake, but that's been happening in the downtown core for quite some time over towards the Niagara region and that is pushing over there towards the shorelines of eastern Ontario as well. So that's really going to be something to watch in those areas too because it's going to bring down the accumulations and you're not likely going to see them as high as what's anticipated. So snowfall warning still in place, winter weather travel advisory there in blue, but it has been dropped back towards southwestern Ontario where things have improved there. So watch this line here where I have this mixing and see how it's spreading into eastern Ontario down towards the county, towards Trenton, Belleville, Tyendinaga, through that region all the way towards Napanee and Kingston. You're going to find that mixing in and then as things cold, get colder tomorrow that's when it freezes and all of these areas all the way back towards Toronto we could be seeing some really slick spots especially if you get a dusting of light snow on top of that so it kind of hides that icy those icy areas so I want you to watch out for those uh, side roads and certainly for your sidewalks and be really really cautious there close to the lake okay but otherwise things do improve we get a bit of lake effect as the winds will kick up from the northwest a bit tomorrow and you're going to have some flurries coming back at you there a little bit too into southwestern Ontario 15 to 25 centimeters in areas to the west of the GTA closer to the lake shore it's that kind of near 15 because because of what's happening with the temperatures and those temperatures will be falling Kelda overnight tonight so by tomorrow morning it's going to feel like when you factor in the winds about minus 10 that's going to be a big change. Finally tonight for nine days every January a normally sleepy and quiet village high in the Swiss Alps is filled with hot air. <laughs> This is the 40th anniversary of the Hot Air Balloon Festival. There are 60 balloons from 15 countries. The event attracts up to 35,000 spectators. Now, an unusual feature of this event is the unique winds that change direction during the day. They allow the balloons to fly out in one direction in the morning, then turn around and fly back in the opposite direction in the afternoon. The festival wraps up on Sunday. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Maribel Taruk has our next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night and stay safe out there, everyone.